We're just gonna give everybody a minute to hop on here for the live. Is it going now? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is. Yep, we're just gonna wait for some people to hop on. All right, Dr. Toller, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Uh, my name is Dr. Kyle Tobler. I'm here at the Idaho Center for Reproductive Medicine. And we're doing these uh, Facebook chats just to talk about various topics that are important to us, important to you guys as patients and fertility warriors. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about recurrent pregnancy loss. And it's one of the more common things we see uh, and just go through kind of the basics of step you through how do we how do we evaluate it? Um, what are the treatments for it and some of the controversies surrounding it and, um, in that it's, it is a challenging diagnosis a little bit about myself So I've been here at Idaho Center for Reproductive Medicine about one year uh, I came from North Carolina previously. I was uh, uh, There's a, a reproductive endocrinologist and decided to make the move out out west um, well, just to launch into it, so recurrent pregnancy loss, what is, what is it? Typically, it defines a patient that's losing er, early pregnancies re repeatedly. Uh, and the, the actual definition of it is three or more losses. However, if there's two consecutive losses, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine recommends that an evaluation can most certainly uh, is, is warranted, and that, that's abnormal enough that you should look into it and that we don't require somebody to or force anyone to have uh, repeated losses. In fact, if a, if a couple has one loss and they're worried, um, looking into why did that loss occur, it most certainly could be between the doctor and the, the physician and the, uh, the couple, but that, that could warrant getting looked into. It really depends on what's going on with the patient or when to, when to perform this evaluation, but, but the classic definition is about, about three. Okay, here we would initiate it after two if the couple desires to have it evaluated. That's the most important thing. Um, how often do we see this? We see it in about oh ten percent to a quarter of our patients are going to have some form of losses, and it could be a combination. And often is it's a combination of they've had some early losses uh, and they have trouble getting pregnant. Sometimes we can we understand right when they come in the door what's going on. Uh, why the potentially they had these losses or uh, what the infertility issue is or what, what the challenges to getting pregnant or staying pregnant is. Other times there's just there's no idea at all. In some, in some cases a patient's been seen by their OBGYN and have had some evaluation or a lot of evaluation and a lot of treatments including fertility treatments for recurrent pregnancy loss or progesterone. Um, there's a long list of various things that can be tried. Um, and when we see them, we, I like to break it down. So as far as what, what's going on, what, what, uh, how do we figure it out? We, I like to break it down into the various processes that are going on in, in human reproduction and embryo development and, and approach it that way. And part of the problem is about 50% of the time, we don't identify what the problem is. It, and it's not because there isn't a problem, it's just we can't, we can't find it. And often that is because we can't evaluate the embryo. Okay, the embryo is key here. So the, the first, um, first thing to think about is looking at the actual anatomy. So look at the, we look at the uterus. We do that through a series of imaging. We can use what's called a hysterosalpingogram, or it's a, actually it's a dye study of the uterus where we take an x-ray of the uterus and it gives us a nice outline of the inner contour of the uterus. Another way we can do, we can do that is with a saline infusion or a water ultrasound. And again, that's using water in the ultrasound at the same time excuse me, water in the uterus at the same time we're using an ultrasound. And what we're looking for is what are called Mullerian anomalies. The primary one that can be most problematic is a septum. And a septum is formed when the uterus is being formed as, as, as an embryo. And as the woman is forming an embryo in her mother's womb, the uterus starts out as two tubes and it comes together. If it doesn't come together completely, then it leaves, a, potentially it leaves a fibrous band along the middle of the uterus. That fibrous band can be very large or very short. It can extend all the way from the top of the uterus down through the vagina. 
because it's not typically well, uh, well vascularized, then when the baby implants and it starts to develop that placenta, then it's just not gonna find the vascular supply that it needs and it, the pregnancy can fail. Um, like many things in medicine, the, there's an evolution of how we evaluate things and how we treat them. Um, this was actually a very common thing to think about and, and approach. Now there's actually some controversy in uh, how large of a septum should be resected and how problematic are these septums. Uh, one issue with this is the baby, if the baby doesn't implant on the septum but implants on the other side of the uterus, everything can be just fine. Um, so how often should we have a patient undergo a surgical a surgical evaluation or a surgical removal of the septum, again, that can be uh, debated among specialists. But typically, you would use what's called the hysteroscopic approach, and you would remove that septum. So that's one of the classic anatomic issues uh, that can cause recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, the, next thing, the next thing to think about is the, the parent's genetics. That's another one. So when you're forming as an embryo, or you know, start out as one cell and you start dividing out, the chromosomes that you inherit from your mother and fa father uh, can sometimes be flipped on each other, and they're called translocations. And there's a variety of translocations that can occur. What happens is you'll have all the genetic material you need to form as a human being and function, and typically they're not associated with any sort of health problems. The problem lies is when you separate your gametes, your two chromosomes get separated, and there's a recombination event that occurs to help with diversity within your gametes, within your sperm and egg. And what can happen is a little bit of that, of that chromosome, or a lot of that chromosome, can lost or be added to. And so the embryo, or the gamete that then is formed to make the embryo, doesn't have the correct number or the correct pieces. And that allows the embryo to form, and depending on where that air is, that embryo will then arrest. It can arrest, if the, if, if the translocation is severe enough, you won't even get pregnant. It will arrest before implantation can happen. If it's in other places, you can actually have a second trimester lost. So how we evaluate for that is we do what's called cytogenetics. We do a karyotype on both the mother and the father. This identifies a problem in about 5% of couples. Uh, uh, this is a blood test that we do, and uh, it's uh, the nice thing about this, it's very diagnostic and it's very useful. When we identify this, there's a clear path ahead of us on how the treatment should go. What we do is we identify where that problem is and then we, we create embryos through the in vitro fertilization process, which is a whole nother talk. And then we can analyze the embryos and look specifically for those translocations. We usually will analyze all the chromosomes for problems, but we can find which of those embryos are unbalanced or don't have that correct, that correct set of chromosomes, okay? When we identify that and we transfer back into the uterus an embryo that has the correct set of chromosomes, then success is extremely high. So that's the good news. We identify a clear problem, we can address that problem, and then the patient couple moves forward. So um, that's a, the good part of that evaluation. Another thing to look at is hormonal evaluation. So we look at uh, diabetes. So when a patient has diabetes, oftentimes diabetes can be we use often we use it we call it the silent killer where you don't feel, you don't know you have diabetes, and uh, when diabetes is not well controlled, then that definitely can interfere with the developing embryo or the, the environment in the uterus. Another would be elevated prolactin levels. So these, that's a hormone release from the pituitary. When that's too elevated, that most certainly can cause uh, an early loss as well. Um, the next type of uh, evaluation that we routinely do is called an antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So this is an autoimmune condition that can develop from patient within a patient, and we don't know why it happens. So autoimmune disorders are a combination of a patient's genetics combined with their environment. It can be an internal environment, like what they eat, or external, their kind of external exposures. And we don't know why. So many autoimmune, there's many autoimmune disorders, and it's really just how you respond to your environment. Um, so what happens is you can develop antibodies that then can cause problems with typically with placentation, when the placenta is starting to grow. But it can involve itself in the endometrium, okay? And so we can see problems with just implantation. We can see problems with developing the placenta, so early loss. The placenta forms after about seven weeks. But we can also see later problems as well. So uh, issues with like preeclampsia, um, uh, uh, obstetrical complications. 
Those antibodies are identified through, again, through a blood test. And because antibodies can sometimes be challenging to be accurate when we measure them, we actually repeat it later down. There's a list of speci very specific criteria for a patient to meet, anti meet antiphospholipid antibodies. They have to have certain events occur. One of those events, they have to have three consecutive losses. They have to have a second trim or a second trimester loss. They have to have a, uh, a preterm delivery due to preeclampsia or a, also be a hypertensive disorder and then have those antibodies be present both 12 weeks apart. So, you know, kind of a complicated um, scenario to put together or criteria to meet. Um, once, that's, once that criteria is met, though, again, there's a pathway forward. So we use it, a Lovenox, which um, is a blood thinner. And the idea with that is that it can assist with uh, avoiding the antibodies that cause problems when the placenta is forming with, you know, like my, with microthrombi or thrombosis within the, uh, within the placenta. Also, that could occur just generally in the body. So the patients put on uh, Lovenox after they become pregnant, and then also baby aspirin. Typically, the baby aspirin started while a couple's trying to conceive, but it can be also started after. That combination has been demonstrated to decrease the risk of, of miscarrying. Um, additional evaluation. Um, so these are some of the more controversial ones that, that can be done. But you could do an endometrial biopsy, looking at the lining for chronic endometritis. Chronic endometritis is heavily debated in our field and has been around for a long time. The idea is that there's not an actual infection, but the immune system is essentially ramped up and is behaving as such there's an uh, infection and which can interfere with implantation. Typically, it would cause a late loss, but it would implantation or an early loss. How we treat that is with a series of antibiotics and to help kind of decrease that, the, the inflammation. Um, another uh, controversial one would be on the male side. So with um, sperm, typically when sperm is abnormal, it's an all or nothing event. The, the A can recognize that and fertilization just doesn't, doesn't occur, or you have early embryonic arrest. However, a condition called high levels of sperm anti uh, excuse me, sperm DNA fragmentation can occur, and that's the, the DNA within the sperm is broken up essentially, it's fragmented. If it's in a way that the embryo can form, there, there can be higher rates of aneuploidy in the embryo or chromosome abnormalities. Um, that can be analyzed through a, a test where we analyze the sperm for the fragmented DNA. The good news is there are, depending on the cause of it, usually lifestyle modifications or antioxidants given to the to the male partner, those can reduce the fragmentation and, and assist with that. Again, this is another thing that's, that's uh, heavily debated about its utility, but de definitely within the literature it is there. Another even more uh, hotly debated uh, issues is uh, digging further into the immune system with like natural killer cells, uh, with L HLA typing. These are immune issues that most certainly are real but we don't know exactly how to measure them accurately. The evidence is, uh, is controversial, and the recommendation is it not to be done, uh, except at, inside of an uh, a approved research protocol. Part of the issue with some of these things is, well, what's the next step? How do you modulate an immune system for HLA problems or for uh, natural killer cells, which the actual measurement of them is not entirely clear. So again, those are, there's, there was one question for a patient that um, she had a lot of questions about testing the immune system and these further more controversial tests. Again, uh, the evidence is not clear. There's some providers that absolutely following guidelines that say we should not be doing these things that outside of research protocol, um, they're there for a reason. And that's partly to protect patients um, from being uh, taken through things that are not proven, that are not evidence driven. Now, is there nothing to that? If you dig into the literature, absolutely, there's some papers there, there's uh, preliminary investigations into these things, and uh, perhaps and, you know, a few years down the road, that they, it'll get ironed out. But right now, I, you should consider these things experimental and unclear. Um, sorry for my pause there. Um, so those are basically the kind of the, the, the basic evaluation moving forward. Um, tr treatments, treatments going forward. This is actually kind of along with what I was just talking about, kind of controversial. How, how, do we, how do we take care of a patient 
that has recurrent pregnancy loss. They have the evaluation and essentially, like I said, 50% of the time, it comes back all normal. Does it mean there's not a problem? Absolutely not. If we look at what's the cause of losses, the number, if we look at the baby that's being lost, the number one cause is chromosome abnormality, but you can't pick that up in the parent. What happens is it's a spontaneous chromosome abnormality. As the, as the egg and sperm, they unite, and then the, the, egg, the fertilized egg starts dividing out into an embryo. Well, chromosomes can be, uh, the numbers can be too many or too few can be divided out. Literally, if you look in the egg, there's a mechanism of pulleys and spindles. It's actually a feat of engineering that separate these, these chromosomes. As a patient becomes older, these spindles and, and pulleys, they actually age with the patient, and they don't work as well. They don't work at... They don't work as well to separate out these chromosomes. So what happens is aneuploidy or chromosome abnormalities in babies goes up as a, as a woman ages. Um, with that increases the risk of, recurrent, of pregnancy loss just in general. So with increased maternal age, you have increased pregnancy loss. If we analyze uh, the, the tissue of uh, miscarriage, the, up to 70% of these losses, in some cases even higher in some studies, but up to a, a generally a, a accepted rate is about 70% of losses is due to chromosome about specific chromosome abnormalities to that specific embryo that you can't pick up uh, in any prior evaluation. Now this occurs in young people as well as older people. And um, really the only way to screen that is through the IVF process. Again, this is a couple who comes in with nothing else wrong for them. The most effective way for it is in vitro fertilization. Now the couple may um, not understand why do we need in vitro fertilization? We get pregnant just fine. Well, it's not to do in vitro fertilization, it's to allow us to analyze the embryo. So what we do is the, the patient couple goes through in vitro fertilization, we create the embryos, we grow those embryos out for five to seven days. As the embryo turns into what's called a blastocyst, it allows us to perform an embryo biopsy. And we remove about six cells off the trophectoderm or the future placenta of the embryo. We then freeze the embryo. The embryo can stay frozen essentially forever. Those six cells, they get sent off to a specialized laboratory that can analyze embryonic DNA. That an analysis will look for the chrom look at all the chromosome pairs, the 22 autosomes as well as the sex chromosome. So typically a chromosome is a 46XY or 46XX. We'll look at all of those. Depending on where that chromosome error is, then the embryo may not implant or progress or it can implant and be lost early, or it can progress to have a live-born baby like, with, like Down syndrome, like trisomy 21. So we'll be able to identify those things. By doing that, typically the, the pregnancy risk, the, the risk of recurrent pregnancy loss is dropped down to a baseline level, okay? Somewhere around five to 10%. Here, I think we it's even lower. Um, uh, following the analysis of the embryo, we then take the patient through what's called a frozen embryo transfer. The frozen embryo transfer is a focus on building the lining and creating that implantation window. We give the patient estrogen, followed by progesterone to create the implantation window and putting the embryo back. In some cases, embryos are lost um, through what's called a luteal phase defect. So once when in natural, in natural pregnancy, fertiliz uh, ovulation occurs, the egg is released, and a signal is sent from the egg to the uterus that says, prepare for implantation. And that's through the signal of progesterone. In some patients, that site of ovulation, is now called a corpus luteum, does not function well. And it doesn't send the correct signal, or there can also be feedback problems from the brain, who's also part of that. The pituitary is also sending signals back and forth. Um, definitely a luteal phase defect. It's a it's a debated thing on how to measure it, but most certainly it can cause problems. Uh, it's been um, frequently used to use progesterone after pregnancy to assist with it. By giving pregnancy, you can potentially overcome that defect and help with the pregnancy uh, by supporting it. There's been well done, well designed, large enough studies that demonstrate if a patient is pregnant already, even though they have losses, adding progesterone on does not improve the outcome. And it's unfortunate because it's a very, very, and still is a very commonly thing done, even in the offices of reproductive endocrinologists. Spontaneous pregnancy occurs, we start, we add on progesterone, or even a baby aspirin. Uh, again, that, doing that does not seem to, to assist with keeping the pregnancy. 
The one thing the studies didn't look at is if you start that progesterone in the luteal phase after ovulation in the implantation window before pregnancy occurs, could that improve the outcome? And the potential is, yes, it could. Has it been fully studied? Not necessarily. If a couple is going to use progesterone, then um, probably they should start it in that luteal phase if it's going to be a benefit. The problem with that is it's kind of an obnoxious thing to do. It's either a vaginal suppository or an injection. Those are the most beneficial routes of it. Now that takes us back to that frozen embryo transfer. When we do the frozen transfer, we prepare the line in such a way that we could overcome if it is a luteal phase defect. We're not dependent on those two things, the corpus luteum sending the correct signal to the uterus and the brain not sending the correct signal to the corpus luteum. So we, we can avoid a problem of communication that way. So again, creating those embryos, doing the frozen transfer can help overcome that. Now I apologize, I seem like I'm rambling a bit, but this, you know, some of the, this, this uh, material is, is difficult without feedback from, from, the, from the audience, uh, from a listener. So uh, again, I apologize. We would most certainly in person kind of go through this stepwise, uh, a stepwise approach versus kind of a shotgun of everything I know about a specific topic. Um, so let's take a step back. So, so the go-to most effective treatment right now is doing in vitro fertilization where we actually analyze the embryos and we identify the karyotypes. That is when we don't identify what the problem is in the couple. Now, if, if the, the woman has a, a, a septum or abnormal of her uterus, well, that's something we need to address separately. In vitro fertilization is not necessarily going to help that. Um, if the, the couple has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or the, the, the mother, then yeah, addressing that with Lovenox and aspirin. So again, in vitro is not the Swiss Army knife of all problems, but for the couple who are it, typically most frustrated are the unexplained recurrent pregnancy losses, and in vitro is that way. A caveat to that would be using, we use the term adjuvant treatment. So allowing a pregnancy to occur and then helping support it through progesterone, baby aspirin, and there's a variety of things that are being looked at. None of them have been well uh, analyzed for their, their demonstrated. Part of it is not because there's not a problem with it, it's because we don't know who to treat with it. There's not a good way to study who exactly should start progesterone in the, in the, in the uh, luteal phase or who the baby aspirin specifically is gonna benefit. So we kind of have a shotgun approach. When we do a kind of a shotgun approach, and that's the term adjuvant, then it can dilute out your response. So when you study it, it can make it look like, well, the placebo was just as good as the treatment. Now there's other treatments that can be used, and we use the term for adjuvant, so like using Lovenox, which is a powerful blood thinner um, that is used to prevent or uh, uh, treat blood clots. Uh, that can be added on. Again, the data is, is mixed on that. There's some data that suggests we shouldn't be doing it. There's others that say we should. Again, the studies are small and they're not well designed. Uh, other studies have demonstrated using additional HCG of that pro, uh, pregnancy hormone. We use it in, in, in fertility to cause ovulation to happen, but using that to help stimulate the corpus luteum to make its own progesterone. Uh, that has been demonstrated to potentially be beneficial, but then also studies have looked at it and said maybe it's not beneficial. Again, these things are, are up in the air. Some of the more involved things, so, so IVIG can be used. That's an infusion of immunoglobulins that are used for other conditions. Patients uh, have undergone that and have had success. But again, looking at the studies, it's extremely expensive to do. Um, it's very involved. And then to look at the studies, it demonstrates that, oh, well, it, it may not benefit. It maybe it's the same as a placebo. Again, that's partly not because it's not a good treatment, but who to treat it, who is best served by it, okay? Um, I've rambled a bit at you guys. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Um, recurrent pregnancy loss is, is common, it's frustrating. And I wanna end on a really positive note though. The important to think, the thing to think about is if, if a couple gets pregnant, they've had two or three losses, they get pregnant, what's the likelihood that they are not gonna be successful? You know, they, they could think in terms that it's all gonna be, you know, it's all for naught, that they're never gonna get pregnant again. Um, and it's, uh, it's hopeless. But if you, if you look at some epidemiological data, now this is a study out of the UK, they look over a course of about 10 years, of about 800 patients. And for a 20 year old who's had three losses, Three sequential losses, what's the likelihood that she's going to have a successful pregnancy? It's about 90% in this study. So 
if we were to bet on things, doing nothing for this patient, she's going to probably be successful. So it gives you kind of a, a sense of hope. But let's 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 up it a little bit. So a 35-year-old who's had three sequential losses, what's the likelihood in this study that she would be successful with that next pregnancy? Again, really doing nothing. That's she has a 73% chance. Okay. So if you think about, it, well, yeah, it's a 25, approximately a 28% chance she's going to lose a baby, which is it's higher than the average population, but if you if you look at those odds, the odds are in your favor that you're going to be successful doing nothing. And so you really need to think about that. That um, it can be so frustrating, so devastating, but just if you keep moving forward, um, you're going to be successful. The vast majority of our patients, without digging into all the all the all the controversial treatments and diagnostics, if you just hang in there, you can you can pull it off. So I think I'll leave you there. I'd love to see you. I'd love to help you. We love our patients here. And I'll say goodbye now.